So I think I'll get things started now. I see that uh, in my time here in Ottawa, we're at one o'clock, so we'll get going with this webinar. So I just wanted to say hi to everyone and welcome to today's webinar titled City Studio, Building Positive Change in Cities. This webinar has been organized by Community Campus Engage Canada. It's part of our Community Voices webinar series. Uh, it's one of the first in the series. So thank you for joining us and welcome. And we look forward to a good conversation today. Um, CCEC, our organization, has been building a national knowledge sharing community and a network across Canada um, for all of those who are interested or participating in community campus partnerships. And we're really trying to create a space for conversation, for connecting, um, for capacity building, and, and really for collective action and supporting all of that. So thank you for being a part of this uh, webinar and conversation today. And I'm gonna add some links in the check box about CCEC as we go on. So take a look for those as we go. My name's Magda Gomans. I'm the manager at CCEC. And I'm speaking today from my home office in Ottawa where we're at 29, almost 30 degrees today. Uh, and we're located on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. I'll be your moderator today. And I'm also going to be helping out with some question and answers at the end of this session, at the end of the hour. So our presenters are gonna be speaking today about City Studio. It's an adaptable partnership framework that enables ongoing strategic collaboration between municipal governments and academic institutions across Canada. And following the presentation, as I said, we'll have about 10 minutes for Q&A. And I encourage all of you who are attending to think about any questions you might wanna ask, to put those into the chat box. And I'll be looking at that throughout the presentation and I'll be pulling out some of your questions to ask at the end as well. And if you have any comments to share, please do share them in the chat box as well. And then I'll also let you know that uh, a recording of today's webinar is going to be made available on the CCEC website. I'll send out an email to all of you after the webinar, letting you know about that and when that's gonna be available. And so I'm gonna get the conversation going now by providing a bit of an introductory summary of City Studio. Um, as a Canadian charity, City Studios research and work over the past 10 years has focused on important gaps between municipalities and their academic institutions across Canada and around the world. City Studio closes this gap by guiding lo local partnerships to launch and operate a local city studio program. And so City Studio has received various recognitions over the last decade, including the Willis Ward for Innovation from the Canadian Association of Municipal Administrators, the Inspired Educator Award from the Green, Canada Green Building Council. And they were listed as one of, Can, one of Canada's top 100 recovery projects just recently over the last year from the Future for Good. And now I'm really happy to introduce Dwayne Alvarum. He's going to start off the presentation today and introduce our other presenters as well. Duane is the executive director and co-founder of City Studio Vancouver, as well as a designer and educator. He's taught at universities for 20 years, first at the UBC School of Architecture, where he created the Hornby Island Design Build Program, and subsequently at SFU's Center for Dialogue as an associate and visiting professor. He has also held positions at the Emily Carr University of Art and Design, and has at Assistant Dean for the Foundation, Academic Advisor, and Assistant Professor in Design. So welcome, Duane. Thank you for joining us today. And I, I look forward to hearing your presentation. So I'll hand it off to you now. Thank you, Magda. <laughs> and welcome, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here with CCEC and uh, share the story of City Studio. So I'm sharing this story uh, from the land of the Squamish and the Musqueam and the Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Um, where we're working on the City Studio project with a lot of patience, but not yet permission in this unceded territory. And it's always really interesting to learn where other people are listening about this story from. And if you don't mind putting into the chat um, where you're coming from, what city you're coming from, or what uh, First Nations lands you might be on, any way to share the kind of geography of where we're, where the, where we're reaching today. Um, uh, I'd like to start by having our panelists uh, introduce themselves, and we'll be hearing from uh, them throughout the presentation a little bit. And if we could start, I think, is Brad in the house yet? I am. Oh, Dwayne. Brad is there. Oh, wonderful. Welcome, Brad. So um, uh, if we could start with the co-presenters, Brad and King, say a little bit about yourselves, and then we'll move on to the City Studio team. Brad, would you start, please? 
For sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, great to be here. My name is Brad Bedell. I'm the Assistant Director of Sustainability with the City of Vancouver. Uh, I've been with the city for about eight years now and uh, involved in uh, all of our sustainability and climate work here. And for a number of years, I've been fortunate to work uh, really closely with Dwayne and Miriam and the rest of the team at, at City Studio and also to mentor some projects myself. So uh, great to be here this morning. Thanks. Thank you, Brad. And uh, Kinga Colton from the City of London. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kinga. I work at the City of London as a supervisor of policy and strategic issues. Uh, my main role at the city is supporting the community diversity inclusion strategy, which is our community plan. Um, and I've been involved in City Studio for the second year that it's been running, and it's been a really, really great experience. Wonderful. And we'll hear more about the work in London throughout the presentation. And then um, I'd ask the City Studio team to introduce themselves. Uh, Miriam, would you like to start? Of course, Dwayne, thank you. Happy to join you and Brad for this webinar and Kinga for, to, to hear more about our story and sharing it with others. I am the director of City Studio Vancouver, which was the original you know, City Studio 10 years ago. And I started being the director uh, last year. And I'm also the general manager of the organization. Um, so yeah, I'm very happy to, to be sharing the date with you today. Thank you, Miriam. And Alex? Hey everyone and welcome. My name is Alex Lineker and I'm the business development lead with City Studio Global. Thank you, Alex. And then uh, Suparna. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Suparna. I'm the marketing and sales coordinator for City Studio Global. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So um, uh, I'll just say that uh, I'm the ED and co-founder, as uh, Magda mentioned, but I think it's important to say that I'm, I, first and foremost, I've always been an educator in my life. And I think that I'm coming at this as the ED of a society, but the kind of the educator in me is always influencing how we do our work and what we should be focusing on. Um, with that in mind, I, I think it's also important to say that this is the story of how we um, moved into the gap between municipalities and academic institutions. Because as educators, we found that there was no way there was really no door on City Hall that we could knock on and say, how do our students get involved? But there was a lot of interest in students to get involved. So this kind of urge from ourselves and our students to do it, to help and to contribute. It's also the story, I guess, of uh, what is education ultimately for? What's, it, what's its civic good and its civic potential? Uh, how can we help universities expand their social mission? And how can we move toward a more democratic and inclusive city building? Um, and I'm hoping this story will encourage folks in the audience to reach out to us and learn how to join our network and learn how to kind of connect to this movement of youth and cities and universities and kind of a deep collaborative model. Change slides here. See if this works. There we go. So. Uh, City Studio, uh, it kind of in its essence, is an adaptable partnership framework between academic institutions and municipalities. Uh, it's a kind of one-stop shop. It's a plug-and-play kind of model that we help cities uh, identify the potential to work with their academic institutions. Then we set up the relationships. We help develop stakeholder engagement, and then we uh, train the staff at City Studio, and then we teach the folks how to kind of develop projects. And in that ongoing network, we maintain the network. It's really, an, essentially, it's a kind of matchmaking service that match city needs with university and academic institution capacity. It's also a bit of a problem distribution mechanism, meaning that the, that the city has problems and challenges. And it's our feeling that we need more people working on these every day. And these include everything from experiments to prototypes and to research. But how do we get us working together in the everyday business of city building? And in our work, we found that there's a common and persistent gap uh, between cities and their academic institutions all over the world. We probably talked to 300 mayors and city leaders and university leaders, and they all say the same thing. We don't really work together that much. Although there are special projects, initiatives, research, pieces, there's always city staff who might work with planning or health. There's always kind of uh, 
work going on, but it's hard to find, it's hard to, to kind of hold. And uh, it's surprising that two of our largest public institutions in Canada don't really work together regularly in the everyday business of city building. And we see this as a kind of large and untapped opportunity. Um, there have been the current notable rise of work integrated learning uh, across Canada and around the world really. And that's a kind of another, another way that this work can express itself. We do this work in, uh, in, at City Studio and in Canada, uh, funded by the McConnell Foundation, Vancouver Foundation and the Business Higher Education Roundtable. The um, McConnell funds us for national social innovation Vancouver Foundation funds us for provincial social innovations and business development. And the Business Higher Education Roundtable funds us for uh, national integrated uh, work, integrated learning experiences, especially in marginal and rural communities. Um, it's a really interesting kind of process that we've been involved in because we're we're really interested in the kind of way that people get engaged. What is the science of engagement and what does it mean? And when we started this work, we found that students were coming into our classes asking the same two questions kind of over and over again. They wanted to know how to save the planet. They wanted to know how they could earn a living doing it. And it was really, as a kind of instructor, it really affects you. You start to, you start to um, realize there's a lot of energy to be working and contributing, but there's not a lot of access. There's not a lot of way to do it. Students were depressed. They were thinking about their debt. They were seeing ways to work in the, in the uh, they were seeing the problems every day in the city, but they actually weren't provided access to the problems in their classroom. And this ends up being quite frustrating for the students and, and for the faculty themselves. So the design challenge was how could we give any class the opportunity to work directly um, where assignments could contribute directly to the the kind of civic fabric and become a civic good. In terms of engagement, we were wondering, how is it, when do people have their most engaged experience? And um, th this became kind of a guiding question. We probably asked this question thousands of times in, in the last 10 years, uh, trying to figure out what is the kind of nature of deep engagement and why, and, and can university be like this in a regular way? And so if you're like anyone else, you probably haven't had your most engaged experience in front of a laptop. Although, you know, I'm trying to tell a story that has engaging qualities to it, but I recognize this has limits to engage us deeply. Um, if you're like everyone else, you probably haven't had your most engaged experience in a classroom or even on a campus. You've probably had your most engaged experience in a group. You've probably been outside. You've probably used your mind and your body. You're probably struggling to do something real together. Uh, you've probably had personal responsibility. Your actions have probably had consequences. And it's quite a simple formula. And this became a kind of foundational um, demand on our system. Could we create opportunities where students would more likely feel deeply engaged than not? And it's always a really interesting question to learn when people had their most engaged experience. And so if anyone from the audience feels like they might want to share it, when did you feel this kind of prolonged sense of full attention? Um, when, when did you have the sense of in timeless investment, like time disappears? And then importantly, when did you have the sense of this experience? There's a loss when this experience ends. And uh, it's kind of a deep, deep loss. If anyone wants to share examples of that in the chat, it would be really interesting. So. We do this work of deep engagement while at the same time, try, time, time trying to add value to the city and to city staff and civic fabric. And we do this through a kind of a, a, a bit of a, 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 a range of project types. We do research for the city. We connect research entities and students with city staff. We need research. We connect them to do analysis projects for city staff. Uh, we connect them to do mapping and prototypes, design, mock-ups beta tests, we do a lot of experiments uh, that can lead to permanent solutions. And we do a lot of demonstration projects. These are like second stage experiments, policies, and programs. And we always ask, what is it that the faculty can do? And we communicate that to city staff. And then a city studio asks, what, what 
do what can uh, what do faculty need, and we communicate that to um, faculty and departments on campuses. Um, I'm going to show you an example of what this kind of work looks like in the early days. This is deep engagement meets value add. And these are a fair number of project examples that kind of give you the range of things that we do. And I'll just start off. Uh, this is one of the first ones that we started working on. This was a, um, a, a question of uh, working with inside the Greenest City Action Plan with city staff. The question was, how do we access, uh, how do we increase access to green space uh, for citizens in Vancouver as part of the Greenest City Action Plan? And uh, the city, like many cities, own lots of property, and a lot of it is small, unbuildable property, things like pork chops and boulevards and strips. And the students started to really get into the idea that they could map all of these small spaces for citizen use and city staff use. You can see in the upper left that we mapped four neighborhoods or five neighborhoods in Vancouver, and we mapped all of these underutilized orphan spaces, they called. And then Jackie and Becky and Victoria um, worked with city workers to design and build a frame, a piece of public art on one of these pork chops. And you can see in the bottom left, it was just really an Instagram moment for citizens and visitors to kind of frame themselves against a mountain. But um, it really did add value to the city staff. It started to increase the profile of these kind of early Greenest City Action Plan projects. Um, and then it also had the added benefit of um, deeply engaging the students. And we started to, to realize there was something that we could do that had this kind of mutual benefit. And the students said things like, this is how they got, this is from the, um, the feedback from the experience. This is how I got my life because it's real. The difference between school and city studio was often dread versus excitement. Going back to normal classes were quite a challenge after that. They talked about how their comfort zones had widened. They gained tangible skills for change work. Uh, really interestingly, they, they started to set up professional personalities. What does it feel like to be in a professional role? Uh, for a prolonged period of time. Um, they started to see that the relationship skills transferred outside of school. And it was a bit of a tipping point where students started to understand their value as citizens who could contribute real value on a real project in a very tiny way, in a very kind of humble way. Um, other projects, that, that ranges from the built to the experimental and the prototype to the policy our uh, Vancouver Immigration Partnership is part of the New Start strategy. It's a, it's a collaboration at Langara between nursing and marketing, where it's a long-term project about how to improve, understand and improve settlement services through the Vancouver Immigration Partnership. Municipalities working with fed, fed, federal government, working with um, local not-for-profits and local service deliveries as an example of a kind of policy piece, but can change lives on the ground and students working directly on improving settlement services. Another kind of project we work on are tech projects. This is part of a, a Transportation 2040, um, where uh, uh, collaborators from Harvard and from UBC really started to think about, look, we don't really want to be driving around. We don't really want more cars and we don't need more parking, but while we have it, it has to work better. And how can we use tech and app development to make um, and AI, particularly, to make uh, parking more efficient in the city. Another project type that city studios can work on are uh, uh, bio biodiversity and uh, green infrastructure projects. This is part of the Greenest City Action Plan, where UBC environmental science students, uh, a, kind of a large UBC team, worked with um, Angela at the Sustainability Group to do foreshore work around research, and mapping, and it's a beautiful story because it not only engages the students, they get the chance to present to city staff, but city staff get engaged. There's a really quite famous story around Angela, Daniluk, city staff are bringing hot chocolate who are working who are the, to the students who are working on the shore late at night, gathering uh, nighttime data, nighttime sample collection, uh, uh, sample collection, and bringing the hot chocolate. and. She, it's just this idea of kind of being more deeply engaged together, which is quite, it's profound and quite touching when you're in the middle of it. Another project um, 
is a collaboration with BCIT between marketing, interestingly, and nursing, working with strategic initiatives at the city of Vancouver and Vancouver Coastal Health. And uh, you know, you're probably all aware of the tragic situation on the opioid crisis in BC and Vancouver in particular, and really, like really around the world, but we're a, quite a tragic hotspot. And what does it mean uh, to have uh, kind of this dispersion of needle uh, waste? And what need, does, does this represent a kind of opportunity to understand the problem? Does this represent an opportunity for business in any way? Does this represent an opportunity to kind of work through one of the obvious problems to help solve the larger problem? this Be Smart with Sharps project. Um, and then moving on to uh, a kind of a range of um, more built environment projects. This is the studio outside, this is the a plaza outside our studio where we we run constant experimental projects, murals and uh, the, of course the, the, the Keys to the Street Piano project and uh, street seats where we do tactical urbanism, chair bombing and things like that quick and go sometimes projects. This is um, famous because it's uh, the location of uh, Vancouver's only public footstool, which is a bit cheeky, but also a bit interesting that, you know, we know how important footstools are in life, but we don't really have them in the public realm. What would happen if we did? Another kind of projects, uh, series of projects that we do work with planning and landscape architecture and environmental design to design and build community gardens around Vancouver, large demand. There's a long waiting list for community garden plots. And, uh, and uh, what can students and schools do to help do this? And of course, there's no more interesting project for a young architecture uh, student than to design and build their first garden shed for shovels and soil and whatnot. Um, and they end up being quite wild actually, um, but welcome by the community, quite fun. And uh, inevitably get a lot of media attention. And the, the community gardeners are really I find, I find this adds great value to the, the kind of initiative and engagement by the young people and the students. Another project uh, that comes out of a, a kind of city studio alliance with municipalities and academic institutions are a kind of these demonstration projects or prototypes. This is the long table project. A group of students had the idea that we needed a way to engage citizens outdoors in the public realm to talk about the issues of, in this case, of the Greenest City Action Plan. What would engagement look like? How do we understand the aims of the greenest city more clearly? And uh, a tree really fell in a park and uh, the, the civic arborist uh, gifted the tree to us. Our, the students cut it up, they milled it, they dried it, they designed and built the table, um, which was an extremely ambitious and incredible project. And, and you can see the table in action in the bottom right. It's uh, 30 feet long, three sections. Uh, 10 feet each. Um, another kind of thing we do are these pop-up parks, everything from one day parks to longer parks. You can see uh, Jackie and Becky in the frame as a pop-up park, but also a deeper biodiversity collaborations in the pollinator garden where architecture students built bee houses. Um, bottom left is uh, a, a little parklet where seating can really change the way a park is used and the kind of in the kind of comfort and the welcoming of citizens, and then turning this idea of seating into a, 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 a social good, where in the middle bottom, you see that Langara students working with the Downtown East Side Resident Association and Business Association, uh, to, we're working on the heat island effect in Vancouver. And how is it, how would it be possible for citizens themselves to design the location of seating to make the heat island effect and the kind of warming city core um, more tolerable. And so these seats can be designed to be moved around where citizens want them in shaded areas and too heavy to be stolen or to, to be, uh, to be um, moved or to be stolen. And then one day pop-up parks you see in the bottom right. Um, and so that gives you a little taste of the, what it's like from inside City Studio. And then uh, it, Brad, if you're ready, I'd love to turn it over to you to say a little bit about what it's like to uh, work with City Studio from the staff side. Great, thanks, Dwayne. Um, so yeah, I'm often asked when I'm speaking with other cities, what's in it for city staff? We're, we're all busy, uh, what do we get out of city studio? So I'll speak to that in a couple of slides here. So the first, which, which Dwayne really highlighted through the last few slides is that city studio is an opportunity to test, explore and experiment. Uh, it's work being done by students. It's, it's 
typically of a fairly short duration, it's a chance to test stuff out, which we don't really have that opportunity within our typical city roles. And it's amazing how given that opportunity uh, to, to test stuff out and explore uh, the amount of creativity and ideas that come forth from, from city staff. The second one that really jumps out is, is students do bring a unique perspective. They're a, a big percentage of our residents in the city. Uh, we don't do a great job of engaging with them all the time. And through these projects, you really see that they bring a unique perspective. They're passionate about their work and their subject matter. Um, and they bring that to these, these projects. And the last one is sometimes it, it starts with just a question. And that's getting at, I would say, that the approach with city studios, it's low barrier. If staff have a question that's been on their mind, on the side of their desk that they haven't had a chance to explore because we're busy with the day-to-day -day kind of churn. Uh, City Studio offers that opportunity to, to, to put a question out there and have the students explore it and to, to, to kind of run with it, which is a unique opportunity for us. Uh, next slide, please, Dwayne. There's also almost a professional development opportunity here for staff that I would say it took me a little bit to, to kind of catch on to this side of it, but. Uh, the way projects are done at City Studio is very differently, very different than how we do it, certainly at my City Hall. My background is as an engineer. Uh, I learned through a kind of a very linear process of evaluate options, do the costing and feasibility, build the thing and, uh, and, and walk away because surely we've, we've built it right. Um, City Studio has quite a different approach. I, I think the first thing they, they really focus on is asking better questions. So there's a lot of uh, probing and poking around, are we asking the right question in the first place, which can really take you in a different direction, an interesting direction. The second piece is around prototyping, and, and Duane showed several examples of that prototyping type project. Uh, it's not something that was in my skill set before you know, being exposed to City Studio, but this idea of putting something out there that's uh, lighter touch and seeing how it works. And if it works well, great, uh, iterate, improve, and, and slowly uh, establish that that practice. And the third one is, is this idea of iterating. So it, rather than trying to get it right on the first one and walking away, iterate and adjust and adapt over time. And again, that's a really different approach, certainly for myself that I've learned uh, in working with students and, uh, and City Studio. Uh, last slide, please. So why do I participate? I've mentored a whole bunch of projects over the last few years. This photo here is from a project that was uh, done by uh, a master's class, a master's uh, program in education for sustainability at UBC. And the question that they were given is that we offer uh, discounted trees for homeowners in Vancouver as a way of improving our, our, our forest canopy in the city and kind of rewilding the city. Uh, but half of our residents aren't homeowners, they're, they're renters. And so the question was, well, what, what can renters do to play a role in this, this rewilding of the city. It's something people are really interested in and passionate about. Uh, and this group just ran with it and they ran with it in a really creative way. And what they came up with here, uh, what they're holding in this box is, is a rewilding kit uh, that would work for balconies and patios. And they customized several different kits of not only different sizes, but the species in there were specifically chosen for uh, a particular butterfly or bees or different sorts of wildlife that inhabit our city. It was a really clever project. Uh, they prototyped them at farmer's markets and had good uptake on it. It's something that we as a city and uh, the park board are keenly interested in now building on. Uh, and just, this is hubbub, the event that they offer every year, twice a year, sorry, at City Hall. And again, the costume and just the creativity they brought was, was fantastic. So it's a project I'm really uh, proud of. Thanks. Thanks, Brad. Um, and I'll uh, pass it on to Kinga Coulter now to say a little bit about uh, her work in London. Oh, sorry, Kinga, I'm going to go back. There it is. So hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me this afternoon. Um, so just I'm just going to give you a little bit of background of what I do so you can help, um, better understand the project that I've worked on. Um, so as part of my role at the City of London, um, I support the uh, community diversity and inclusion strategy. So a lot of the student projects have been focused on supporting that strategy and kind of moving it forward and working with the community to do the work. Um, so within the strategy, we have five working groups that um, work on five different priorities. Um, and the projects that we focused on are a lot of, about research and development of tools and um, 
information guides on the topics related to the strategy. So last year, uh, we actually worked on some research on xenophobia, Satanism, and ableism. Um, the racism one actually landed very well in everything that was happening um, around the world and in, in the United States and in Canada. So we actually ended up having a um, a panel discussion with the students who worked on the racism project in the summer of last year to present their research and kind of engage with the community to better, better understand how racism um, plays out in London and what are the experiences of community members. So the students had the opportunity to interview and to hold focus groups with community members and engage with the community um, through that project and kind of learn about what's happening in London, and what's important to kind of to move the work forward. Um, this year, we focus a lot more on research rather than engagement. Uh, we recognize that when it comes to diversity and inclusion, personal connection is really important. So it's really hard to do that through Zoom. So we focus a lot of our projects on projects on um, development and research. So we worked with a communications class to develop an inclusive meetings toolkit. Um, we research. Uh, we did research on employment and experiences of immigrants and racialized uh, populations, and uh, something that we wanted to kind of keep on top of what's happening and so, and looked into how COVID has affected marginalized populations. Uh, one of the topics that the students looked at was employment and how that has played out um, within London and also within Canada and our region. Um, so through our projects, um, a really really big focus is for the students to go out into the community, learn about the community and work with residents rather than just working directly with um, city staff. Our, for my project, the big focus was uh, since a lot of the students in London do come from outside, now, um, from outside of our community, and it's sometimes even their first time leaving campus and actually mm. going out and learning and engaging with the community and seeing how these things play out and how you know to engage with community. So it, a lot of the feedback we've received was that we didn't know this was happening in London. Oh, this was a great opportunity to kind of just learn about the community because I've never been off campus before. I've never mm. you know learned about London as much as I have because they've been going to class coming back home and doing their work or going out with their friends, but they've never really gone out to the community and learned about it. So um, kind of took the students away from, you know, the regular research and academic writing into more of a community engagement and community learning um, perspective, which they oftentimes don't get to do since they're in university, unless they do take like a community engaged class. Mm -hmm. um, for us, for city staff, and for me, I think it was really good to kind of get that different perspective uh, from students. I A lot of the students that we worked with have been so great. They asked the hard questions. They're not afraid to ask the questions and to kind of engage with the community and get out there and um, do what needs to be done uh, to get the work done, uh, you know, to move the work forward. Um, they're really engaged. Um, as Brad was talking and as Dwayne were, ta were talking, since our, uh, City Studio just launched last year. Our first year, we actually did have a collaboration between two classes. So we had a theater class working with a psychology class. So we had <laughs> two like completely opposite disciplines um, working together and they've actually created something that you did not expect. The, um, the, um, the psychology class was the one doing the research on xenophobia and racism, whereas the um, the theater class, they did podcasts and uh, videos and all those things to kind of go with along with the research. So we did something that we thought might have not worked, but it worked out very well. And we got together and had supper together uh, throughout the year and kind of, you know, met and talked and kind of connected. We, we built almost like a close knit family. <laughs> Uh, where we kind of connected with each other. The students could text me and ask me questions whenever they needed something. Um, and I think that was a really good experience because that kind of helped a lot of the students um, just be engaged and be comfortable. And some of them now have me as a reference and they can kind of reach out whenever they need something and help them with um, applications for post postgraduate schools and some of their employment. So I think um, a really big benefit was kind of for the students to get these connections in the community and meet people and, um, you know, use that experience to kind of move their life forward and move their career forward. Um, 
So yeah, I think so far, Sudis Kyudu has been such a great benefit, not only to staff, but you know, to the students to kind of learn and be engaged. Hmm. Wonderful, Kinga. I love that story about, I didn't know the story about the uh, psychology and the theater. Wonderful. Thank you for that. So, uh, if a little bit has come out uh, in the presentation about the benefits to staff and the, a lot about the benefits to students, but the kind of the takeaway, the important takeaway here is there's a there's a kind of re, a predictable pattern of mutual benefit um, that comes with this work. Anytime you work on a project, you have city staff, cities and city staff working with faculty and researchers and students working with communities. So that's kind of a the kind of the recipe for all of the projects. And uh, in the 10 years that we've been doing this work, we know it's strategic collaboration and we know it's experimentation and we know it's inclusivity, but you kind of wonder when, it, when is it those things and when is it what? Um, but it's almost always the case that there's this relatively, well, meaningful, significant mutual benefit in that the cities in the city studio network, they have a, now a permanent channel to the academic institution. So it's like this, they have a pipe and they can put anything through that pipe that they want. And that pipe is managed by the city studio coordinator uh, in each of the cities. So there's a kind of permanent on-call person who's managing relationships, scoping projects, making sure that things are moving back and forth between the pipe and putting things in the pipe to kind of provoke responses from both sides uh, and kind of thinking about what people need. It's all sometimes jokingly referred to as the cruise director. Um, in introducing people and making sure people know where the buffet is, and making sure people know what's happening at six o'clock. So it's a kind of active role. That's for the city. And then through this a channel, city staff can connect with any discipline uh, from any work plan area, from any management area, department of the city. Um, and it's just a matter of creativity and mixing and matching what discipline, what research, what student group, what class would add value to what area of the city and where are the city's greatest problems. Faculty and researchers gain access to the inner workings of the city. Um, for most of us, I would say, for most of our lives, city halls and city workings are this kind of black box. You go there to pay your uh, taxes or you, may, you might go there to get a piece of information on the dog license. But for most of us, we don't engage with city halls at all. And so there's this kind of now reason to engage regularly. The students gain these integrated skills for work and um, networks and projects within their credit classes. And importantly, the citizens are provided ways to engage on issues in their city. Citizens become experts and they are able to contribute this expertise on a project that's in their neighborhood uh, that shows change. Um, we have a process that is basically five steps. I, I, I don't want to spend too much time talking about this, and I'm happy to answer questions about this later. But basically, all of the ideas come from city staff uh, in the early days of a city studio. As the trust is gained, ideas are exchanged back and forth more easily. But for the most part, we're trying to solve the city's problems. And the matchmaking happens through a coordinator uh, who then shepherds the projects, launches them in public, and then shares the projects at uh, our uh, semi-annual hubbub project showcase, which is family and city staff and counselors, the mayor um, and faculty and students, and they all come together. And you can see in the bottom right, this kind of large showcase of projects, which projects can become permanent, um, what, what projects can go to further development, what have we learned, what can we present at council? This is an example of uh, uh, Miriam's work uh, in Vancouver. As director of the Vancouver program, she oversees uh, up to 50 projects a year uh, where every project is working with the city staff and a faculty member is part of a strategic plan. You can see in the little uh, pullout image, those are the city plans that we're working with and which faculty we're working with. It just gives you a sense that one coordinator trained can really start to match many, many projects over the course of a term. Sometimes these are over the course of a year. Sometimes these are week-long projects, sometimes they're term-long projects. Uh, and I said, uh, sometimes they're research, sometimes they're, they're built. And it kind of doesn't matter. It's just it's this kind of collective aggregate energy of the work. Um, and then this work can have a big impact in a city, for sure, in a municipality or a 
in a region, in a township. Um, and interestingly, the, the cities can have a collective impact together. This is a, a, a diagram showing where our city studio network exists so far. Uh, I think we have 15, 14 or 15 in progress, 15th in progress city studios uh, with 11 in Canada and, and then one in Oslo, Norway and two in Australia. And the aim is uh, with the support of the McConnell Foundation is to interest enough cities to gain I mean, possibly double the size of the network in the next uh, two or three years. And then really begin to think about what kind of collective impact we could have together. What, what could 15, 20 or 30 cities and their universities and their colleges uh, do together? Uh, there's a really a couple of really interesting standout uh, examples in, in the City Studio Network. One is uh, City Studio Durham, which is a region uh, in Ontario, north of Toronto. And uh, there's eight townships and municipalities in the region of Durham, all working together. And the region of Durham holds uh, the, is the home of the City Studio, as an example. Um, and then we move all the way from uh, Victoria to Cornerbrook and on the far right up in the North American part of the map, you can see. Cornerbrook, 19,000 people, two classes a year, usually part participate in the city studio at Cornerbrook. Um, but those two classes in a, a small town have a lot of profile you present to the city hall every year. Gives you a sense of the of kind of the scale and the, the, what the network can do together. Here's a, the same story by the numbers in the 15 cities, uh, since the start of the network, 17,000 students have worked with about 800 city staff and 800, 900 faculty, contributing 400,000 hours of their class time for civic good, for public good, and for uh, the benefit of the city, contributing to their communities in about 2,700 projects. Um, and you can imagine how quickly this can, can grow and the kind of aggregate effect of the collective impact can be quite significant. We're starting to see that. Um, we, do a, we do an impact report. We're about to launch our second uh, long-term impact report. Um, and the impact report has shown that over the last, over the first six years of our work, that uh, there was a significant interest and significant benefit to the city. 91% of all participants, students, faculty, city staff, uh, community members and experts, 91% felt the city studio model really was making the city more livable, joyful, sustainable. 87% uh, felt more connected to their city, 76% were inspired to take action, and importantly, we use this um, marketing, this kind of touchstone marketing metric, likelihood to recommend. Uh, would you recommend City Studio to a colleague or to a friend or to a coworker? And 84% would and do. So it's, it shows that, as you've heard from Kinga and from Brad, this feeling of being connected and watching this work in action is quite, it's a compelling thing to have have in your professional relationship and it moves beyond just the students, which is extremely rewarding to uh, learn. Um, one of the pieces we're working on now is universities and colleges turn more and presidents especially, turn their eye more with more focus to the sustainability development goals, the UN SDGs. Uh, a couple of us uh, city studios in London is one of them who are really trying to connect the thread between a city studio project, a uh, a, a, a strategy inside a city and how that strategy is in itself part of a much bigger UN sustainable development goal. And they're starting to map it for students and uh, faculty and staff. If you work on this little parklet, you're actually contributing to something at the UN level. If you work on this little piece of community transportation, you're actually contributing to the much bigger picture. Um, and this is early work in these days. Not many universities have joined formally the UN SDGs, but this, the tide is starting to shift quite significantly. And I think we'll see this growing substantially in the coming years. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about, we've been, we've been really fortunate to, to be recognized for this work. I, uh, I think it's well-deserved by cities, by our staff and by city staff. We're working very hard to create new kinds of cultural infrastructure in cities. And uh, uh, the, futurist, the futurist Holden Bon Witt uh, one of the folks that we work with said to me yesterday, he's starting to see this as a kind of antidote to the tragedy of the commons. It's more like the tragedy uh, of the tragedy. What did he call it? He called it the tragedy of the, 
in the tragedy of the abundance of the commons, he called it. This is like the abundance of the commons. All of us working together have a kind of a, in, increased effect that is greater than just the addition of all of us working together. Uh, the thing about the awards that stands out for me, it's wonderful to receive recognition. And it, it's wonderful to receive recognition after a ton of hard work, ongoing hard work by staff. But the where they come from is what's most interesting. We're recognized by different sectors of society, different cultural groups, different paradigms, different mental models. And it means that this kind of collaborative framework invites folks who, who don't just come from the university and the municipal sector, that multiple different sectors see a door with their name on it. And uh, that's the lesson. So as we're starting to build more doors. Who else can see a door with their name on it that can join our work? And with that, I'll. Uh, stop, ask for questions. If you have any other questions, please leave them in the chat. I think I'm gonna turn it back over here uh, to Magda, if uh, she's there. Great, thanks, Dwayne. That, awesome. was, that was such an interesting presentation. I know for me personally, I was taking a lot of notes there because there were a lot of um, really interesting projects and thinking about the different ways that students have been getting involved has been really inspiring to hear about. Um, I know from our perspective in supporting community campus partnerships, um, you know, a lot of the themes that you were talking about are things that we hear commonly. And so it's wonderful to hear about these kinds of um, really fruitful success stories around these projects, you know, thinking about things like, um, you know, meaningful student experiences, uh, meaningful relationships being built, um, the effects for communities, for surrounding communities. And so all of this it just sounds really amazing. And so I'm going to, I think I'll take a few moments now, we'll do our Q&A session. And I'm going to take a quick look here in the chat. I noticed there were a few questions about students. And so I'll just take a look here. Now, Dwayne and all, all of you, please let me know who would like to answer these questions. I don't know if uh, you can let me know who would like to answer. So, um, some were asking about students, and one of the questions was, uh, when you mentioned students, is this only university students primarily, or are there college and other students involved? I'll just say that we work with university and college post-secondary, all ranges from first year to PhD students and researchers, um, but Abbotsford and Logan in Australia, uh, just outside Brisbane, are working with high school students as well. And it's very, it's a model that can adapt to all range of learning. Mm. Including, including youth outside the formal education network. This is new territory for us. We haven't really explored this very formally, but working with BCIT, we're trying to imagine who are the groups of students that are excluded, who are the group of youth that are excluded from the higher uh, post-secondary sector? And, and is it possible to work with them in a kind of, uh, kind of a formal way if, uh, if there's interest? Mm -hmm. And if I can add the ways that they look, it looks to the work, you know, with earlier year students than from, you know, third or four year students or research students is very different because it, we try to match that the project and the collaboration matches the learning objectives and the, the, you know, at the stage in which a student is. Depends on whether it's just generating awareness all the way to critical thinking or, you know, research, as Dwayne was saying. So the collaboration can take on different ways with the same question as Brad was saying, you know, maybe one question takes on many different forms, depending on where we place it in the spectrum of uh, education. Thanks. Great. Um, I have another question here in the chat box that asks, how does a city or university get in the network? Oh yeah, uh, I think Alex can answer that question. Yeah, for sure. So if you're a university or college um, that is in a city that already has a city studio, but your school is just not part of it yet, um, you'd get in contact with your local city studio that already exists. And if you're in a city um, that doesn't have a city studio yet, then the first step would be to get in contact with us at City Studio Global. Um, and we have a process to assess whether your city um, is ready and like what stakeholders you need to get in contact with to gain buy-in for your for your city. Um, so really the first step is getting in contact with us and then we, we help you every step of the way through it. Great to hear. Okay, I have another question here. Um, these types of projects seem to require a lot of buy-in from various stakeholders like city staff and faculty of different institutions. 
Um, so how do you ensure buy-in from all those stakeholders? Yeah, so this is a very interesting question because um, uh, it's obvious that the city studio model is an amazing idea and it's a, it's a, it has an untapped potential, but it's not obvious if you don't have one yet sometimes. And uh, I often think about kindergarten, you know, 1920, there were no such, there was no such thing as kindergarten. And in 21, there were kindergartens all over the world as people started to realize the value. Um, you know, it's re reflecting back on the reason kindergarten started. It's a, it's a kind of controversial topic, maybe around the industrial revolution and putting our kids in boxes. However, the idea that something that was barely imaginable, that's now seen as a civic good, a public good, um, is kind of where we're at. And so the, the, there's usually city staff who are really interested in this kind of thing. And they're usually faculty members or administrators who are usually interested in this kind of thing. But if the mayor isn't interested or the city manager, or if the vice president or a director of strategic initiatives isn't interested, it's very hard to kind of push this idea up into that space. So our goal over the next couple of years and the goal of the network is to increase the literacy around the ease of developing a city studio and around the benefits of it at the leadership level. So we're really looking to kind of have more and frequent conversations with municipal and academic leaders. And if you're someone in a city who wants to get started or wants to reach out, we can have that conversation with you about how to have those conversations and we'll participate in them as well. I'll just say one more thing that the political tone of a municipality is always really important. Sometimes youth engagement, campus engagement is high on the strategic list and sometimes it's lower on the strategic list. Um, so, but youth are almost always high on the strategic list. So we try to go through the portal where there's kind of the most um, political momentum, if that helps. And if, I, and if I can add Magda one, one or two words from the City Studio Vancouver perspective, there is already a need for city staff to talk to experts in academic settings. What we do is streamlining this as opposed to haphazard calls and you, are you talking to this person? Mm. So what the city is empowering us to be, you know, like the switchboard as Lane was saying, you know, like we take the calls, we make the connections, we manage the relationships and we streamline those relationships. Mm. Thank you, Mayu. I know that having that capacity and that resource support is so crucial for, you know, a lot of good ideas that come together, but just don't have that support. So that's what's really encouraging and inspiring about this model is that mm. that's there. And, um, you know, connected to that, I know that, you know, some of these questions have been answered in various ways, perhaps through the presentation as well, but I'll, I'll read through some of these other questions. Um, where does the money for projects come from? Yeah, excellent. Um, um, well, maybe I'll let Brad answer that question from the city staff point of view, and then I'll, I'll, we can pitch in from city studio if it's helpful. Yeah, so... The city provides uh, funding to, to City Studio. So we have a four year agreement currently with City Studio to deliver uh, X number of projects every year. And, and uh, as, as Miriam mentioned, a huge benefit for us is that we are often reached out to by universities seeking to partner with us on various projects. And uh, without City Studio, we would either miss opportunities or we would just be bombarded with a lot of requests. So that coordination is, is hugely helpful for us. Uh, but we are not the only funder. Uh, Duane can speak more to the universities contributing as well. Uh, so it's really a, a collective kind of funding model for the City Studio Vancouver. And just uh, before I mention that, Brad, the projects themselves, um, staff often have a small budget for projects, and these are kind of considered pre-incubation projects. These aren't large consultations or things. These are just a pro small project work. And Miriam, maybe you could speak to the kind of the funding model at City Studio Vancouver as an example, and I could speak generally if helpful. Yeah, as Brad said, we have agreements with each of our, the partner uh, institutions, the, the, both the city and each of the post-secondaries, according to the level of engagement and, and benefit that they see. And some partners, some universities or post-secondaries have joined, you know, um, with a tentative or pilot level. And, and then we see the potential and, you know, we graduate them and explore more and more. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm sure that uh, um, there is other models in the network from, you know, and in, in, um, there is uh, ways in which I, Alex, you may know this better and I'm going to stop, but I'm just going to hint her on what I'm thinking, uh, that there is um, models in which the coordination is done by either a staff or a faculty member that has a secondment role to be doing the city studio. So there's different ways in which other members do find resources to, to, to develop their city studio. 
Hmm. I'll just add, yeah. So we have a collaborative funding model. So every city studio um, may fund in slightly different ways, but we say uh, money from this uh, municipal government to help fund it, as well as each academic partner. And some city studios are also in part funded by um, different grants that they apply for and receive. Um, so primarily those three avenues. Yeah. And then in terms of starting a city studio, it's basically population based. Um, and there's a kind of startup fee and then there's a network membership fee. Um, and, but, and, but we're working with BHAIR, the Business Higher Education Roundtable, and they're trying to develop work integrated learning opportunities across Canada uh, in rural communities, Manitoba, Saskatchewan included, and as well as the North. And they're providing seed funding to start, start city studios. So we have this kind of pocket of money that we can help cities offset the cost of a city studio as well in the startup year. Wonderful. Um, we have a lot of questions here and a few minutes left. So I'll try and get to a few and um, any that we don't get to, I'll, I'd certainly be happy to send along to all of you an email and we can respond to yeah, everyone definitely. who signed up through Eventbrite with those answers. Um, so one question is, have you ever worked with NGOs or Francophone community? Oh yeah, I saw that one. I'm glad you picked that one. So uh, we have a city studio in Montreal that uh, is operating. It's operating out of the, uh, the not-profit Espace Temps uh, with the Ville and the Concordia University. And there's a lot of interest for Francophone city studios. And uh, it's early days for this. We're, uh, we're working with a high bright platform for our network that is actually out of France. So it's bilingual for the Francophone community. So I would say we're working with the, the now and the, probably a lot more in the future. Um, it's the case that the, the way a city studio is set up is that the city can be the home of the city studio in partnership with the university, or the university can be the home of the city studio in partnership with the city, or a not-for-profit can be the home of the city studio in partnership with the city and the university, if that helps answer that question. Wonderful. Uh, another comment from the chat box. I'm retiring soon from university in Ottawa, and after 33 years, I see we, or Ottawa, is not involved. I'm getting very interested to volunteer in this. So I guess that would lead to a question about what kinds of volunteer opportunities there might be for, for that architectural ex expertise. Oh yeah, this is, um, thank you. I think it's Shibu Pal is the one who's mentioning this. Um, we want one in Ottawa too. And like many of the cities, we've had year long conversations with different staff and different academic leaders, you know, toying with the idea um, and we're about to embark on a more formal, I would say, marketing strategy to reach out to cities and to present formally, gather stakeholders together over the next couple of years. So, uh, Shibu, we might see you in Ottawa when we're allowed to travel. Wonderful. Uh, another question, does City Studio help with streamlining ethical considerations and approaches mm -hmm. for engaging community members? Medium. Did I give you a hard, I give you the hard one? No, no, I was, it was I think related oh. to another one that is in the chat that I was starting to type an answer of whether like how do community members, like are we always city staff led? Um, and and for, for us, you know, we, we try to stick, we have enough with, with, with the city staff led projects and our promise is the city staff, you know, will make their life easier and we're trying to contribute and diminish their workload. If we take projects from the community, we add to the city staff workload, right? We're trying to address already the city staff priorities. And so sometimes a project may involve community members. Um, and, and that is great because that may actually, you know, strengthen or impact the viability of the project in itself. And, and sometimes even the students themselves are, we take them at their community, right? That they are the community that is engaged and participating in the different projects. But most definitely we do take the lead, you know, from, from the city and the city's uh, priorities that they have. Mm -hmm. And I'll also just say that um, we, we work under the ethical agreements that the universities and the city have. So often there's a researcher with a kind of research mandate and ethical clearance and our students operate under those structures. So we don't, we never go into community without permission and invitation and a, a kind of a formal structure. It's very key actually. Okay, well, that's great. I see we unfortunately couldn't address all of the questions. I think we got most of them, but um, as I said, I'd be happy to pass those along and through an email to all the people who had signed up through Eventbrite, I'd be happy to find it 
provide a few answers if if I could speak with all of you maybe after this event over the next few days perhaps. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who's joined. Thank you to to Dwayne, to Alex, to Perna, Kinga, Brad, and Medium. Thank you so much for contributing to this event. Uh, I just wanted to uh, let you know that we have another upcoming CCEC Community Voices webinar series event coming on June 1st at 3 Eastern time. Um, and it's around the subject of social media for anti-violence organizations, research and tools to up your social media game. So that will be hosted, as I said, on June 1st. And I can provide more details about that in a subsequent email as well. So thanks to all of you. I've, I've learned a lot from listening to what all of you have been doing at City Studio. And um, I've heard some really great examples of community campus partnerships, as I said, that are quite inspiring. So uh, thanks to all of you for attending and to all who spoke a bit about City Studio. And I wish you all a great day. Thank you, Megda. Thank thanks, you. everyone. Thanks, everyone.